It's good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. It surely is. Tonight will be this will be our 37th exp exposition of Amos. We're going to be in the sixth chapter, verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> The message that comes across to me in this uh, passage uh, is that the judgment of God is not philosophical. And the impact of those that are judged is not primarily emotional. Now, I want to take a little moment here to comment on this. <clears throat> Most people, when you talk about the wrath of God or the judgment of God or the indignation of God, they philosophize. If you haven't thought about it before, I mean, do some thinking about it. Tell say, this is what I think. This is how I see it. They philosophize about it. <clears throat> now, one of the tragic results of uh, dead religion in an empty form is that it moves men to philosophize about the working of God because they don't have any personal experience, personal recognizable experience, shall I say. They don't have any recognizable experience of God's work. So if you talk about like God's determinations or God's choices or God's creative works or his leading or his judgments, they fall into the I think this is what it is mode. Now see if this isn't so. So put this to the test and see if this isn't so. They'll philosophize about it, but they really don't have anything to say on these subjects. They don't have anything they take on a hold of taken hold of. They're strangers to these subjects. So they philosophize about them. They'd rather not think about God working or God evaluating or God judging. They'd rather not think about that. That's uh, counterproductive to them. Let us get on with our life is how they think. They don't even want anyone to push them to approach this subject. If you insist on talking about things like this, they'll, they don't want that at all. Now, what I'm saying is that's a sign of spiritual death. That's what that's a sign of. These may be very, very religious people. They may make a very lot of profession about Loving God, knowing God, wanting to do what's right, but see, it's just it's just philosophy. It's not it's not true at all. Because a person who has genuine faith wants to hear and delights to hear in divine about divine activity. <laughs> Israel did this when they hear about God's judgment. They push it away from them. When Jeremiah told them about the Babylonian captivity, they didn't like it. They didn't want to hear this. Even though it was their, to their advantage to hear it. And so false prophets, they, they rose up and they, they delivered a message that people wanted to hear. Here's what they said. Jeremiah 14, 13, and 15. Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. See, the saying is in the name of the Lord. Sword and famine shall not be in this land. Well, this is, God loves you the way you are. God wants, God has a wonderful plan for your life. See, these people like to hear this kind of stuff. They'll even make you rich if you'll tell this. They'll open all kind of avenues for you to speak. They like this. What is this philosophy? Human ideas about God. 
When men choose to philosophize and analyze God, they are doing it with a carnal mind. They have a carnal mind. That's why they're doing this. They'd rather philosophize about it than believe what God has said. Now you, not many people you could dare to talk about condemn or hell with. You know, you just they might like they might consent to talk about heaven. You know, it's a wonderful place and so forth. They just don't. It's spiritual death causes that condition. Living in aloofness from God causes that condition. That's why that's what we're seeing here in the in the book of Amos. All theological heresy, every bit of it, and all religious dullness, every bit of it, is the result of living at a distance from God. That's the root cause. That's another way of saying you don't believe. Thus, while the response of Israel... It's the result of choosing to ignore God. This is just how what you do. When you choose to ignore God, you all come to a bunch of wrong conclusions about God and about circumstances. Why? Because God won't let you see the truth. He'll pass a judgment. He'll pour out a spirit of deep sleep. He'll make sure you don't understand the truth, that you don't want it and you don't love it. There's no way you will not be able to figure it out. Now these, what we're reading about in Amos, you think to yourself, who wouldn't understand? Who wouldn't understand this? I mean, this is pretty potent. Israel didn't understand it. It all came to pass because they ignored the prophet. They didn't pay attention to Amos. So all this, all this happened. Why didn't they pay attention? They were too far to hear too far to see. There may be some tremendous things taking place in St. Louis. But if you're not there, you won't see it. You won't hear it. And people that live at a distance from God, he could send his only begotten son who could go about doing good and hitting all of the oppressed of the devil and you wouldn't have the faintest idea what was going on. satisfied with this situation. Right. I mean, it wants to know the judgments of God or the determinations That's of God. Right. It's not satisfied with not knowing, so it, it, uh, faith wouldn't be satisfied in St. Louis. You're exactly right. That's why the stress is on believing, see. All right, let's see our, our text here. Is Amos 6, 10 through 12. And a man's uncle shall take him up and he that burneth him to bring out the bones out of the house, and shall say unto him that is by the sides of the house, Is there any with thee? And he shall say, No. Then shall he say, Hold thy tongue, for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breaches, and the little house with cliffs, with clefts. Shall horses run upon the rock? Will one plow there with oxen? For ye have turned judgment into gall and the fruit of righteousness into hemlock. Well, since everybody, it's obvious what that means. I suppose we could just move on to something else. But this is how God talks to people that are aloof from him. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make any sense to them. When God commands us to speak about judgment to the obtuse, that means they're dull. Their mind is, they can't get out of first gear. It seems to me that he purposefully makes it impossible for them to understand it. That's, this is how God is. See, man isn't like this. They'll stoop down, get down on their hands and knees and try and lisp it out and explain it all to it. This isn't what God does. When a person's heart is hard, this is the way God talks. You can imagine how that sounded. Be like Jesus saying, 
except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, and that's the explanation. People thought he'd lost, lost his senses. Now, this is why Jesus spoke parabolically to the multitudes. He hid the truth from them because God hadn't given them the right to hear it. Hmm. See, everybody ought to hear it. Well, that's true, but for some people, they ought to hear it so God can condemn them. <laughs> oh, no, that doesn't, it's not pleasant to say that, but that's, well, let's hear from Jesus what he said himself. Because the disciples asked him, yeah. how come when you talk to the multitudes, you use parables, but when you talk to us, you straight out? Why? Oh, here's what he said. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seen see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross. It stinks, in other words. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. And you might add, and I don't want to heal them. That's what he meant, isn't it? Isn't that what he meant? Why would he do something so someone wouldn't be healed? Because he didn't want them healed. There's some people God doesn't want to heal. Some people he doesn't want to straighten out. You say, well, I thought he would that all men be saved. Yeah, that's a broad statement. That's saying that anyone who wants it can have it. But anyone who doesn't want it can't have it. God won't let them have it. That's why you try and explain truth to some people and they just can't get it. It's not because your explanation was bad. That's not why. It's because God won't let them have it. He won't let them understand. So he's going to talk like he did in this text. He's going to, he speaks kind of a strange way. Horses on rocks and plowing rocks. And so why is he talking this way? Because it hid, it hid what he was really saying. They'd gone too far. Three yet four transgressions. They did. They went too far. Now I don't know where this line is, and I don't want to know where it is, right? Frankly, but God knows where it is. <coughs> Thirty years after, you know, Jesus wept over Jerusalem because they didn't know their time of the visitation. And thirty years after Jesus returned back to heaven. What he said still hadn't happened. 30 years later, three decades later, he told them the house was going to be left desolate, the army was going to come from them. 30 years later, it still hadn't happened. And I know there were people that didn't think it would happen because he didn't tell them it's going to happen 70 years, 70 AD, 40. It's going to happen 40 years. He, but he didn't tell them that, see. His words of warning had probably been forgotten by that time. They thought they were safe. And they remembered his words, people did, when the armies were there, and it was too late. All right, let's look at our text. And you expect it to be, be phrased in not, not common language, to say the least. A man's uncle shall take him up. <laughs> well, some other versions kind of clarify a little bit. Now remember, a curse has happened. He's telling you the circumstances when the curse had happened. He told him he's going to devour them. He's going to burn their houses. He's going to see. So this is what's going to happen during that time. Here's the uh, New King James Version. When a relative of the dead with one who will burn the bodies picks up the bodies and take them out of the house. So they couldn't get out of the city because they're surrounded. <clears throat> 
There's dead people all over the place. There's disease festering all over the place, and they got to get rid of the dead. So they got Iran's relatives had to go in the house and pick up the dead folk. That's in the house. How would you like to have a job like that? Well, see, when you forsake God, we can't guarantee what kind of job you may have. This is the kind they had. Here's another New American Standard version. Then one man's uncle or his caretaker will lift up to carry up out his bones from the house, and he will say to the one who is in the inmost part of the house. So he, when he's carrying it out, there's someone on the other end of the house. Another living person over there. Here's another version, the NIV. And if a relative who is to burn the bodies comes to carry them out of the house, the Amplified Bible says, and then a man's uncle or kinsman, he who is to make burning to cremate or dispose of the pestilence infected bodies. So this this was like a job that had to be done. Had to get the dead out of their houses. And you, you were in the middle of being dominated by an enemy. And so here they are, going in the house, kinsman, relative, go over to so-and-so's house and make sure all the dead folk are out of it so that the disease doesn't spread. Eh? There's nothing pleasant about that, is there? Huh? Nothing pleasant about that. Israel didn't think about this when they were creating their idols and making up their own spiritual holidays and cooking up music that God hated. They weren't thinking about things like this. Now, now I said, this is what's going to happen. Relatives are going to have to come in and dispose of the body. Now, normally, normally they'd bury the bodies. This is a unique circumstance. They don't have time. They can't go out of the city. They, they couldn't bury them. So they, they had to burn, burn, burn the bones. I gather that the houses had been burned down and probably the flesh had already been burned. But anyway, what a, what a job to have. That judgment should have been unforgiv unforgettable. During this time, none was able, would be able to escape. He told them that nobody's going to be able to escape. During that time, that's in the second chapter, verse 13. During that time, the, the horsemen, the bowmen, the footmen, they'll all be powerless. All their skills will dry up. They won't be able to do anything. An adversary would bring down their strength, the third chapter, verse 11. Even the remnant would be taken to Samaria. Their vain religion would fall to the ground, third chapter, verse 14. Their magnificent homes would be destroyed, third chapter, verse 15. They would be forced to leave the city and go into captivity, fourth chapter, verses 2 and 3. God would withhold the rain from them, and the thirsty would not be satisfied, fourth chapter, verse 7 and 8. All the vegetation would be consumed, fourth chapter, verse 9. The kind of judgments that came on Egypt would come on them, chapter 4, verse 10. Israel would fall, be forsaken, and none would lift her up. Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Wailing would be in their streets and their vineyards. Chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Wherever they go, their sins would find them out, and judgment would fall on them. Chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. God would reject their worship. Chapter 5, verse 21 through 24. And all of their luxury would be destroyed. Chapter 6, verse 3 through 8. So this is a... <clears throat> This should move a person to have some pretty sober thoughts about God. Amen. Is there anyone that thinks like today this couldn't happen? That somehow God's changed, he doesn't do things like this anymore? Or could it be that some of the reports we get from around the world is this is actually something like this taking place? Amen. Maybe that's what's actually taking place. Amen. These worldly countries, third world countries, have all rejected God, with a few exceptions. Uh -huh. I'm not saying it's what's happened. I'm just saying you got to open a door because that may happen here too. Yes. He that uncle enters in, he that burns him. 
couldn't even bury the dead. Good, no dignity like that was permitted under the circumstances. Staggering numbers of people, probably rotting corpses. <laughs> he had to do something with it. While he's, while he's carrying out, Arte says the bones, which leads you to release the either the corpse had rotted or been burned or <laughs> it's a bad situation. He sees somebody else in there, in the house. He says, are there any with thee? Anybody else in here beside you? <laughs> That's the one entering the house to carry out the dead. <laughs> well, he's not hysterical. He's got his, got his wits about him. Have you noticed that in times of crisis, it's phenomenal how people can sober up and do things. Have you noticed this? They should have done that when it came to worshiping God and serving God. They should have been alert like that in their connection with God. Well, I've seen it. Tornado happens. People, people coming to help. and It's something about crisis. People are able to do things they normally wouldn't do. But why don't they do things like that when they're... With, when there's not a crisis. Why doesn't some battalion of people come here to evangelize people and wake them up from the dead? Why isn't that happening? Why does it have to be a crisis? Well, it is real. It had to be a, a crisis. Now the issue is, see, normally death was the exception. Is anybody dead? That would be the normal question. Is anybody dead there? But now the issue is, is anybody alive there? That's what happens in spiritual fall, too. In a spiritual fall, it isn't, is anyone spiritually dead? Now the question is, is anybody alive? We just can't you see that? Well, that's a sign that judgment, judgment has been taking place. Divine judgment has been taking place so that someone's living to God, alive to God, having faith in God. They are now the exception. Why are they the exception? Because God's judging the place. Amen. That's why. That's right. <laughs> well, the man answers, hold your tongue. <laughs> That's the uncle went in there. Hold your tongue out. Don't say anymore. One version says, keep quiet for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. That's the New American Standard. The NIV says, hush, hush. We must not mention the name of the Lord. The Amplified Bible says, hush, hold your cursing tongue. We dare not so much mention the name of the Lord lest we invoke more punishment. You might talk foolishly like Moses did when the people provoked him and he spoke unadvisedly with his lips. You may say, if God's there, how come this happened? Hush! Don't say anything. If God really loves us, how come to hush? Be quiet, don't open your mouth. This isn't the time to be talking about the Lord like that. We've already demonstrated what we thought of God. Don't be talking about him now. See, there is a time when the Lord is earnestly sought but cannot be found. Proverbs 1.28 Really serious? They were serious? Now they were serious. Couldn't find them. The ultimate time, of course, is going to be the return of the Lord. The foolish are going to want in. Open the door! Open the door! He didn't even say sorry. No, he didn't say this. Oh, the door's shut. I don't even know who you are. Wicked and slothful people. That's going to happen when Jesus comes. They're not going to call on the name of the Lord, of course. They'll be calling rocks and mountains to hide them. 
See, brethren, today is the day of salvation, and anyone's going to call on the name of the Lord, this is the time to do it, and they should not wait to a crisis until there's a crisis to do it. Because you don't know that you'll be able to do it when that happens. <laughs> and there you have quite a grim picture. Somebody hauling the dead out of the house. Another man in there says, yeah, there's a, I'm, no one's here but me. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. <coughs> this is not the time for talking. Not now. Let's just get, get down to the business of getting rid of the dead here. Then he adds a little something. For behold, for behold, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breaches and the little house with clefts, clefts, like a wedge. For behold, <coughs> some versions leave that expression out. Some versions read a deed look or for low or look or for indeed or note well. The word translated behold is what's called a demonstrative particle. I thought I'd just kind of throw that out. What is a demonstrative particle? It's a word that says this is why all that happened. That's the kind of word. So it says, behold, it's just more than just look. It says, what I'm going to tell you now is going to explain why all this carnage happened. It's important to know. He's going to trace things back to God. He's not going to trace things back to the Assyrians that did all this, you know. Those Assyrians, they always were ruthless people. We kind of saw it happen. We saw it happen. The Assyrians gaining more ground, you know, and gaining more dominance. And they were just like those, those Russians, those Muslims. They're gaining more ground. But I was going to say, no, that's not the, that's not the answer. The answer isn't the Muslims are more eager than the Christians are. That's, I know this is what the people say, but those kind of people should be told, hold your peace. Hush. Stop trying to explain this situation. We already know why this situation's here. It's God has been abandoned and forsaken and maligned and his name disgraced. Don't be talking to us about what's happening in the world and why it's happening. Or climate changes or the world heating up and stuff like this. We already know why this stuff is happening. You're going to trace it back to God. God's at work. Here's what he said. God the Lord commanded. He's given a commandment. NIV says, at the order of the Lord... Basic Bible message says, he's given the command, the net Bible says. God issues the orders, the message Bible says. What he said is, this has happened because God commanded it to happen, or it couldn't have happened. Amen. Everybody here can see, can't you, that havoc can't happen unless the Lord either commands it or says, go ahead. We ought to be able to see this. The Lord commands. <laughs> see, what God purposes, he does. That is what his command. When God commands, he's doing what he purposes to do. There's no chance that what he purposed will not come to pass. No chance. Here's what God says. No other God can say something like this. We which have believed to enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. God just doing what he, what he purposed. And God says that he's the only God that can tell you what he's going to do and then do it. What did God command 
You know, your salvation is traced back to God, not to the time you made your decision or the time you were baptized. It's traced back to God. Here it is, 2 Timothy 1, nine. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen. You will never have confidence until you trace your salvation back to God. You will never have assurance. You'll never have the peace that passes understanding until you can trace your salvation back to God. And you will never understand calamity, heartache, all this sort of thing, unless you trace it back to God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's got to be your response to the hard stuff. Amen. To the hard stuff, that's got to be your response. Look, it's God with whom I have to do. I'm in God's world. I'm God's child. And even if God chooses to take my life, I'm still going to trust him. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, it says of him, he will smite the great house with breaches. Now, some of the versions, they really present a, a, in some of them are an erroneous view. It says, he'll break the great houses into bits. The great house shall be smashed to pieces. The great house shall be shattered into bits. Here's a good one. The great house will be full of cracks, as the breaches are, the cracks. Struck down into fragments, so forth. The idea here is the Lord will command this great and impressive house all of a sudden to have cracks over the, all over the walls. It's a crack here and a crack there. And he's cracking the hot wall so it can fall apart. Going to make cracks so it'll all fall apart. Now, this is the way God works. The way he works in the spirit. He makes things fall apart first. Now, here's, here's a formula he told you that he, he works. Isaiah 28, 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them, and this were disobedient people, precept upon precept. This is dedicated to the repeat people. People have to repeat everything all the time. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. This is dedicated to those that condescend and dole it out in little teaspoons. Here little, there little. Why do you do that, Lord? So they can learn easier. That's why. No, that's not why at all. That they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. He makes cracks in their wall. Keeps on. Every bit of weight makes the wall crack. <laughs> Little more until finally it's going to fall flat. House will just fall flat. It's an interesting text to ponder, I'll tell you. This is why people that say, stay, keep on working on, keep on working on people. Some people say, well, that's very patient. It's very stupid. Not even God does that. I mean, there's a terminal point, shall I say, till it be done, till, when it's not done. And he'll smite the little house with clefts. In other words, re read the little house into pieces. I like when it says he'll uh, he'll bring rents, tears to the little houses or tents. All of a sudden, in their tent, there's a, there's a tear up here and a tear over there, and pretty soon these begin to spread. If you're talking about life as a as a house. God begins to make it weak so it it can't sustain the weight that's on it. If it's like a tent, he makes it so that it finally it just tears apart and unravels. See, it unravels. This is how God works now. This is how God works. As you're going to judge someone, he unravels. He unravels them first. 
little bit here, a little bit there, he unravels them. So everything they're doing, nothing's working, falling apart. Their religion doesn't work. Their prayers don't work. He's un it's unraveling. He's making breaches in their wall. This is what God does. It's what he did to Israel, see? Pretty soon their kings weren't so, they weren't so good anymore. The judges didn't do so good anymore. Yes? Our text in Isaiah 28, 13 uh, can also be interpreted that the people were kind of annoyed with the <laughs> prophetic message. Yeah. Oh, yes, line upon line, precept upon precept. Can you move on and say something yeah. new? Can you quit repeating this stuff? Yeah. But this was the thing, this was the message that would hold them together. And they saw it as tedious. That's they right. They turned That's away good. from yeah. that. And That's so good. Now they're unraveling as you That's say. good. Mm -hmm. Brother Given, this can also happen to a group of people. Oh, yes. Where he can, he can actually cause division to take place. So That's the right. The does fall. That's so right. So in that case, whenever you're seeing division, like what we're seeing right now, you know, you're seeing this in the church, you're seeing this in the country. This polarization of people may very yeah. well be the beginning of a fall. Take Babel, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the premier example of that. That's right. Yeah, amen. When a man's, on the other hand, by way of comparison, when a man's ways please the Lord, Proverbs 16, 7, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. So he, he, if a man's ways please the Lord, solidity is what happens. They aren't unraveled. <laughs> Do you find people, see, there, there are more Christians than I care to admit that are falling apart all the time. Got some kind of crisis all the time, falling apart. Now, this isn't good. You've got to see this is not good. God can make you stable when you face Goliath. <laughs> he can do it now. Or, or when you face a furnace. Or when you face the furnace. Or, lion's, right, or den. lion's den. See? Yeah. That's how God can do it. But that's through faith, see? Yeah. Only faith can tap into that solidifying effect. In our day, we are seeing the unraveling of the professing church. Everybody that's informed knows this. No informed person in matters of religion, no informed person doesn't know this and doesn't speak about it. Amen. It's a phenomenon that's happened. In his latest book, Brother Billy Graham said that he fully expected people to leave churches and seek refuge in different kind of environments. It's his latest book. People are starting to quote from it already. He said, the modern church has fallen apart. Everybody sees it, but the institutional people, they don't see They don't see it. Just like Israel didn't see this. This was happening. They were already falling apart. Their judgments were wrong. They treated the poor wrong. They were unrighteous in their dealings with people. See, everything was falling apart, but they didn't see it. And what Amos is telling him is, this is God Amen. that's doing this. Then he says, shall horses run up on a rock? The rock? <laughs> Before you move on there, I was considering your contrast that you made about the godly and those who trust in the Lord. Uh, the, the word breaches brought this to my mind that we are actually being made perfect. That's right. So where there's a lack or a breach, that's the right. Lord is filling up those places that's right. to make us solid. Mm -hmm. That's good, isn't it? That's exactly it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> One more thing before we move on. I thought it was interesting that we use an illustration to illustrate these earthly bodies as, as we illustrate it as it being a tent. It's the same terminology as this Septuagint version that says little houses or tents yeah. with rents. So the difference yeah. between a, a tent that has tears in it and a house that God is in is that God is in it. If God isn't in it, then it's going to crumble yeah. and it's going to fall. But if God is in the house, unless the Lord builds the house, 
it's going to fall. But if he's in it, it's an entirely different story. That's right. Yeah, breaches and clefts are preludes to demise. That's what, when your body kind of falls apart, that's just a, that's a prelude to, what, to death. That's what it is. Now the Lord continues to describe these judgments that will come upon Israel. Though it seemed to them like it would never happen. I give you some text where they just reason this will never happen. Shall horses run upon the rock? <clears throat> some other versions say, Do horses run on rocky crags? Do horses gallop on the cliffs? Horses don't run over bare rock, do they? Do you hold a horse race on a field of rocks? No. Why don't? Well, because the hard hoof of the horse slides on the surface is harder than it is. So you get a horse with his hard hoofs, he gets on a ledge of rock, he, he don't run. He's walking real, walking real careful on that. See? Do... Horses don't uh, run on rocks. Anyone attempting to hold a horse race on a ledge of rock, I mean, people will think they are out of their mind. Will one plow there with oxen? Now, i got to share with you what some of the conversions said here. It's very, <laughs> very interesting. Does one plow there with oxen? That's good. Does one plow the sea with oxen? That's a new revised standard version. Will they refrain from neighing at mares? I don't know how they got that. That's a Septuagint version. <laughs> Oceans can't be plowed. That's a contemporary English version. People don't use cows for plowing. That's the English Revised Version. Do men plow the ocean with oxen? That's the Amplified Bible. See, I... <laughs> You, as you can see, there's quite a quite a difference. I understand from those that have studied the thing out that thinking that they're talking about plowing the sea, that that's made, quote, by dividing the words differently. They didn't exactly explain how they divided the words differently, but that's where they got that. But no credible student says it, it, doesn't, it doesn't at all mean they don't plow up, plow the rocks. All of them say, well, that, that would be proper to say that. So I'm going to stick with that. That if you're going to plow up a place to plant seed, you don't go to a ledge, a, a rocky ledge and do it. Right? <laughs> the point of the text is it's unreasonable to expect the blessing of the Lord to come to those that are living in contradiction to him. That's like a horse race on a rock or plowing on a rock. It doesn't go together at all. People who pervert judgment, oppress the poor, rob the treasuries of the temple, live in the lap of luxury, don't have a right to expect blessing. They're plowing on a rock, racing on a rock. There's a manner of life in which it is not possible to do the works of God. There's a, there's, a, there's a way you can live life so it becomes impossible to do the works of God or do the will of God. It just is absolutely impossible, like a horse running a race on a rock. He tells him, you've turned judgment into gall or into poison. That's the second time he's, Amos has said this. He said this in Amos 5, 7. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood. In other words, the outcome of your judgment is things got worse. Your judges passed judgment and the people were the worst. Judgment's supposed to make things better for the ones that never offended. But instead it made things worse. Your judgment, like... Gaul, they'd taken what was intended to correct disorders, judgment, and they turned it into something that made life more bitter than all. 
turned judgment into gall. They took people that were already oppressed and they passed judgment and made them more oppressed. You've turned the fruit of righteousness into hemlock. Hemlock is something bitter. It's a bitter, bitter plant. You've taken what was righteous and you made it poison. In this case, the fruit of righteousness, righteousness is what should have grown. That what, what they did wasn't righteousness. They took what should have been righteousness. The result, they should have had righteous results, and instead they had hemlock. Now, this is the same thing that Israel is said to do in another place under another figure. Isaiah spoke of a condition, God planting the choicest vine, looking that it should bring forth grapes, and instead it brought forth wild grapes, fruits of righteousness that were hemlock. See? It isn't because God didn't make provision now for righteous fruits. He made them the choicest vine, gathered the stones out, built a wine press, built a tower, Everything was in place. He should have got a, field, a crop of good grapes. But they turned fruits of righteousness into hemlock. God couldn't stand it. It was bitter to them. Now, when you think of everything God has sown in Christ Jesus, gives people the Holy Spirit, makes them righteous, gives them exceeding great and precious promises by these to become partakers of divine nature, justifies them, sanctifies them, gives them access to God. And then he gets a crop of disinterested people, people that ignore his word, people don't love his people. They've turned the fruits of righteousness into hemlock. And God is very sensitive about this it's time for all problem solvers all counselors all psychologists to say to people that got problems this isn't something that came from faith this isn't something that resulted from fellowship with Christ this isn't something the grace of God taught you just to let them know this has nothing at all to do with someone that's alive to God. Amen. So if we're going to deal with it, we've got to, get, we've got to start off that way. Yes. You turn the fruits of righteousness into hemlock. See, there are some people, they like to wear the name Christian, be identified, you know, with church and so forth. But they don't care for the truth or for the liberty that the truth produces. This accounts for their flawed judgments and for the bad results it's yielded. Massive amounts of flawed judgments exist in the Christian institutions. And the more extensive the institution is, the more bad stories are woven into it. Every, every Christian college has some horrid stories in its history. You don't believe it? You just, see, I've taken the time to examine it, and everybody knows it. No one denies it. But no one's traced it back to its source. Those who follow the directions of the clerics are not bringing fruit to, that God desires. They listen to the clerics, the professional clergy, they listen to them. They do what they tell them to do. They give their offerings like they tell them to give them. But they're not bringing forth fruit to God, fruits of righteousness. Now God notes this, and he's going to say, look, my son... He's looking for a bride that's without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And quite frankly, well, where's the title? That's not what it is. Like, who doesn't know this? 
we might people might pretend this isn't the case, and they might say, "Well, you shouldn't be criticizing the church." That's we don't like that. Well, too bad. It's, our word is the church should be above criticism. The Bible says, "Blameless and harmless, the sons of God in this generation." That, that's how the Bible says it. God expects His people to live above blame. And he expects them to be harmless, not to be the source of some kind of trouble that riles the flesh. And he has provided for them to be so. That's as right. they walk in the Spirit and live right. by faith. Amen. Now, he, as far as Israel was concerned, under their covenant, he provided everything they needed to avoid the condition they were in. They wouldn't have been ideal because they didn't have the ideal, they didn't have the better promises and the better covenant. But they didn't have to be like they were. They didn't have to be that way. They didn't have to build idols. They didn't have to rob the poor and render unjust judgment. They didn't have to do that. But they did it, and they did it in the name of religion. God said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send some big, massive cracks and fissures in your houses now. So that when the enemy comes, the house will fall down real easy. That's the way God is. Now, on the other hand, and on a more pleasant note, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. There may be no cracks in the wall. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary they'll walk and not faint see just the opposite of of our text here so i would I, i'm very thankful to god for the great salvation he gives we can learn from israel he sure doesn't work to ignore what god has said or to neglect what god has given but when you bring that attitude over into the new covenant israel never imagined what we've got in Christ and you might say every one of us could probably be a lot better than we are I think we could say that and it doesn't mean anyone's bucking against God and it's just saying that it's a pretty aggressive program we're involved in we we're working we're moving toward perfection we admit we haven't apprehended that for which we've been apprehended but we aim to apprehend it and as long as that takes place, God won't judge against us as long as that's there. And if you have a word you'd like to add tonight? Yes, Brother Tony. Yeah, this unraveling we was, was talking about, it's kind of uh, the piece by piece, yeah, right. little by little. You, yeah. uh, uh, we're talking about the religious world. And, yeah. Now, this unraveling has been going on for quite some time. Yes. God, it's just little by little, yes. little piece by piece. That's it. And, uh, until it's undetectable, you, you don't, you really, they can't really see it happening until it's too late. Now, think about the political structure as well. There's never been a time. Yep. But this is all. This, I can look back and see it's been unraveling. Yeah. But there's never been a time really that there's been this much dysfunction and, and inability to get together and get anything done as yep. we're seeing in our day. And, it's, and I thought, you know, this is the little by little, and a piece by piece, God's yep. unraveling this yep. thing. And they don't see it, of course, and then it's just too late. And it's too far. We knew God was behind this, but see, now we we can come here and we say, well, this is, this, this is just the way He works. That's right. The way He works. Yes? When you said people um, like to hear stuff like, um, God has a wonderful plan for your life, I thought when you are putting someone to sleep, you might sing a, a lullaby with nice words or <laughs> nice soft words. Some people like to hear soft words that makes their flesh comfortable and puts them to sleep. But this is not the time to be sleeping. This is the time to be alert and um, ready for the coming That's good, Sister Cindy. That's good. <laughs> no lullabies, please. False prophets. Singing songs. Oh, yes. Lull people to sleep. Yes. yes. And Jesus said that that's what they tried to do to him. They you sing your song. Yeah. yeah. Say, you didn't dance. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. 
He didn't yeah. give them what they wanted. Yeah, lullaby is that what we're looking for? It's war songs and awake <laughs> songs. That's. <laughs> Yes, Sister Ada. Amos, his rhetorical question about horses running upon the rocks and oxen plowing there depicts this reality that there is a spiritual territory that God has designed for us. Yeah. And there are spiritual oh, yeah. realms that we are not to inhabit or traverse upon. And you might try to run there, but you'll end up lame. Yeah. Oh, you might plow there, good. but you'll reap gall and hemlock. Yes, mm -hmm. very so good. Th for Israel, taking this confidence that they were the people of God, and yet also choosing not to dwell, so to speak, in, in the spiritual places he had prepared yes. for them, it was a very dangerous, dangerous situation. Amen. I like that. We we emphasize run the race, and we should, but then consider where you're running it. Where are you running it? Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of Amos, for the revelation you gave through him of how you work. And Father, we... Uh, we don't want to unravel. We don't want to become weaker. We want to become stronger. And we thank Thee that in Christ Jesus the means has been provided to go from strength unto strength. In Jesus' name, amen.